Welcome to this series, In Conversation. Uh, today in the studio with me is Dr. John Barrett, who is former head of trauma at Cook County Hospital. John is the recipient of a distinguished UCC Alumnus Award. John, welcome back to UCC and congratulations Thank you on very your much. Award. It's really wonderful to be back here. Great. John, tell me a little bit about yourself and your background. You're from Cork. I am. I am from Cork. I was uh, born in Turner's Grass, grew up on the Derry and Anne Road. Um, the, I'm the third of four sons, no daughters in the family, and uh, went to Sullivan's Quay. Yes, Christian a great Brothers. famous Cork school. Absolutely, and a wonderful institution. Yeah. All changed now, though. Mm -hmm. And I came to UCC in uh, 63. So I started medicine in 63 and uh, graduated in 69. There was really no tradition of medicine in my family. All of, this, all of the brothers went to UCC and had great experiences. Um, my elder two brothers did science, and when it came my time to make a decision, I was interested in science, but I wanted to do something that was more, you know, human contact. Okay. So I tried for medicine and... Um, and you got it. I got it and I never regretted it afterwards. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, John, in fact, several of your classmates in UCC have mentioned how at quite an early stage you showed a real talent for surgery and trauma. Is that true? Well, <laughs> that's interesting. As I went through medical school, if you had asked me, you know, what do you want to do? I would actually have said... I want to be a general practitioner. Those were the doctors that I knew as I grew up. Yes. But I was interested in surgery, and I recall um, being at a clinic in the South Infirmary at the time, and the professor of surgery was Paddy Kiley. And yes. after the clinic, and you know, there was four or five people around the bed, I'm sure you remember, they were close, intimate encounters. He asked me what was I going to do with my career, so I told him, you know, sir, I'm thinking of being a general practitioner. So he turned to me and he said, Barrett, there's the makings of a great surgeon lost of you. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought of that. Yes. And then I did my internship in the North Charitable Infirmary. Yes, you recall where it was his brother uh, also practiced. K. Jack. K. That's Jack, correct. As he Jack was fondly Kiley. known. He was fondly known indeed. And during, so it was six months medicine, six months surgery. And during the six months of surgery, um, in the, it was called the accident and emergency department at the time. Uh, as as the intern, I got to do a lot of suturing, you know, people yes. would be, and I love that. And actually, initially, I thought I was interested in plastic surgery. That was why I went to Norfolk in Virginia for a year. But plastic surgery is really more cosmetic. And what I was really interested in was the acute injury. Right. And it was there that I had my first exposure to gunshot wounds. And I that couldn't. was what linked. I was I was hooked. So really? That was, well, I came back here and mm. uh, did a senior house officer job and a registrar's job in Finbar's. And, um, you know, I wanted to do trauma. You didn't see too many gunshot wounds in St. Finbar's, I suspect. In my entire surgical career <laughs> in Ireland, I think I saw one. Right. Uh, a, 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 someone who had accidentally shot himself in the foot <laughs> with a twenty two caliber rifle climbing over a ditch while okay. they were going to hunt rabbits. But things changed they considerably. Did. They did. I, um, Professor Brady was the chair of the department at the time, and he um, organized two years of research for me at Tulane, which is in New yes. Orleans. And they have a huge charity hospital there. Again, a lot of violence, and I had a huge exposure to gunshot wounds. And um, people who die from gunshot wounds die predominantly from blood loss. So I did research in hemorrhagic shock. And um, I wanted a clinical uh, exposure. And the premier uh, unit in the United States for that sort of stuff, gunshot wounds particularly, is the Cook County okay. Hospital. So I went to the Cook County Hospital to get clinical um, uh, experience and they said that, well, in order to train, you'd have to do the full five years of general surgery training in America, which I did. I actually repeated the whole thing. And I didn't regret it afterwards because that allowed me to take board certification in America. My original thought was to come back here to Ireland. And practice in Ireland? As a trauma surgeon. Right. And uh, Professor Brady and I talked about it because they were building the new hospital in Wilton yes. at the time. But it became clear that, you know, f to support a trauma unit, you need to have a, a, a certain volume of serious trauma. And it just wasn't going to happen, at least at that time. 
So they offered me a job at the county hospital. I loved the work and there my career remained. was launched. Okay. There I remained, right, yes. from 75 on. Um, we'll go into what you built up as a fantastic department in Cook County Hospital, along with your team, of course. But how did your training in UCC Medical School equip you, do you think, for that? It, I'm a few years behind you, mm -hmm. but I remember a very small group teaching with an emphasis on clinical bedside skills. And now it's a very big uh, medical school with much bigger classes. So I wonder how you feel your UCC training equipped you. Was it a good training? Oh, the, the training I received at UCC was actually superb because it is exactly as you described. It was small. It was 50 people in my class. It was small. It was incredibly intimate. Um, and it was very clinically orientated. Yes. The patient was the center and focus of it. And they focused on your clinical skills. And it's very interesting because I think medicine in America, and perhaps in Ireland as well, is tending now more towards technology. And in trauma, what happens in trauma, and I'm sure we'll talk more about this, is that you are presented with a patient who is acutely dying and you have to act immediately. So it is. it depends on your clinical skills. It is you and your hot little hands and your stethoscope. And it doesn't matter if you have sophisticated technology around you. You don't have time to access it. Mm -hmm. This is a game where seconds and minutes count. And that was the kind of training that I got here. I mean, it was yeah. superbly clinically orientated and the patient and direct patient care was the focus of attention. It was superb, it was That's superb. Very good to hear. Um, I want to go in specifically now to your role in Cook County Hospital. And many people, of course, their experience or their knowledge of Cook County Hospital is from the television series Eeyore. And I've no idea how that series actually relates to the day to day activities that you encountered. But can you tell us a little bit about your start in Cook County and how you built that up over time? Sure. So let me talk about the, the TV series first. Uh, it is actually based on the Cook County Hospital and it's based on the emergency department and the trauma unit of the Cook County Hospital. I actually liked the series. You know, I thought there was a certain um, a gritty reality to it. You know, it, it describes the, the, the confusion, the blood, the people are moving. There's a lot of, of, of things going on. And it, it gives you the impression of things have to be done quickly. And that's yes. very, very true. And they did actually come to the hospital, uh, you know, to see how we did it. Um, you know, the, the ID badges that they wear, yeah. for instance, those are, and the ridiculous yellow, white paper, those are all county things. <laughs> so it's, I think, a, a good, true depiction. I think they had probably wonderful results all the time, and true <laughs> life is not quite like that. And also, I think the romantic part of it is uh, somewhat, somewhat exaggerated compared to my uh, understanding of, or my experience. We'll leave at the that we will leave that okay. at the moment. But yes, I think it is good, and I think that um, series like that have uh, portrayed emergency medicine and trauma surgery in a, in a rather positive light, and I think it attracts people. Uh, there's a certain sort of personality that is attracted by that. Okay. You know, people who are action orientated, who are willing to make um, serious decisions very quickly with minimal information and abide by the results, which aren't okay. always good. And I think it was. I think it was good. I liked okay. it. The latter years, I think, got a little too soap operaish, but. Um, you, your experience of dealing with people with major trauma and death on a day to day basis uh, must have been difficult to deal with on a personal level and the stress that that brings. How did you cope with that and how does your team cope with that? That's very true. And I think um, many people in emergency medicine and trauma don't talk a lot about that. And I think that's bad. I think they should. So I will tell you how we handled it in my unit. The, the unit runs on a series of protocols. You know, if someone comes in with a stab wound to the abdomen, there is a certain sequence that we follow. 
And that sequence has been worked out over the course of many, many, many hundreds of patients. And it works most of the time. When we get what we call an adverse outcome, that means things did not go well, the patient did not survive or there was a serious complication, we have a morbidity and mortality conference. We discuss the case. We all sit down and we talk about it. And it's important to say, not, not you know, well, we had an adverse outcome, what did we do wrong? That's not how the game is played. You say, at the time that I made that decision, or at the time that that decision was made, with the information that I had at that time, was it correct? And that gives you a better sense of, you know, and it helps you to change things in the program if there is a difficulty there. So it is, that's helpful. And this is not a blame game, no. because... This is not about me. This is a team. It starts with the pre-hospital care of the patient, the transportation, the resuscitation, the operative intervention. All of that involves nurses, and I can't speak too highly about the importance of the nursing staff in, in, in trauma and emergency medicine. And I think that's important that the team participates in this discussion. But there are times, there are times when clearly something dreadfully bad has happened, and then you need to have people talk about how we had we had a, um, a pregnant woman uh, who was shot in the streets and was brought in with no vital signs and she was pregnant with twins so we did an emergency c-section tried to resuscitate her and lost her well they she had no vital signs when we came in there was no people but we couldn't save any of them that was horrendous that was yes. really really bad three lives three lives mm -hmm. three lives for what for nothing and they, then we have to sit and we go through what we call critical incident stress debriefing. People are encouraged to talk about how did you feel about that? Because it doesn't matter how good you are in that situation, you're going to lose them probably. Yes. And the chances of survival are incredibly slim. But that doesn't help you when you are confronted with the death. Yes. And um, yes, so that's, that's very important because you can't keep all of that emotion bottled up inside of you and pretend that, well, I'm the surgeon, you know, <laughs> nothing affects me. It's very important to express it. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, you can have serious problems with your team and it can lead to horrible burnout. Um, I'm interested also in whether you were influenced to try and affect change at a political level when so many of the issues you were dealing with in that situation had to do with social problems, crime, gunshot, poverty, all these things that one sees in an emergency unit. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I, I can, and it actually, you know, parallels my career. So I started out and it was it was the the the, the, the challenge of the dying patient, the expertise of the surgeon, the quick decision, get inside the belly, control the bleeding, save the patient. It was wonderful. But as time progressed, uh, I can recall, actually, in the incident. Um, a patient was brought in who had been shot in the abdomen. We were resuscitating him. And I saw there was a scar on his abdomen. And I could recognize it. It was mine. I had operated on him before. And it began to dawn on me that the problem here was that we were saving them but we were sending them back out to the streets, to the exact same situation that created the problem in the first place. So I became very interested, because the solution to violence in the American society, and perhaps everywhere, is not bigger and better trauma centers and more skillful surgeons. The problem is to deal with what is the root cause of violence in that society. And frankly, the, the county hospitals on the west side of the city of Chicago, and on the west and the south side of the city, that's where the poor people live high unemployment, poorly educated, not a great deal of job opportunities. It's, it's, it's a hard, hard place to live. Mm -hmm. And there is massive, massive amounts of weaponry, guns, available to these people. So we began to, we did several things. First off, everybody who came into the unit was routinely screened for drug or alcohol problems. And if they had them, we would try and refer them to counseling services. Um, uh, we looked, we screened for domestic abuse. We established, uh, we called it an injury prevention program. We actually had, my wife was part of the team, from the trauma unit, go to primary schools and talk to children about respect and dignity, that everyone needs to be treated with respect and dignity. And I have, since that time, maintained a great interest in having some sort of reasonable gun control measures. I mean, America 
is a washing gun. Yes, and it's a very hot political potato, isn't it? Oh, it is an incredibly hot political potato. At the moment, we're trying to get what are called universal background checks. That means that anybody who has ownership of a gun has to undergo a background check to be sure that they're not a criminal or that they don't have a serious mental disorder. I mean, how difficult can this be? And if, if, if you buy your gun from a licensed federal dealer, they perform a background check. But once you own the gun, you can sell it. To anyone? To a guy you meet in a bar. Mm. Um, and uh, there is no background check in that. Or you can advertise it for sale in the newspaper or on the internet. And we're pushing to get that loophole in the law blocked. And the, diff and the majority of people in America want to have universal background checks. The National Rifle Association, which is the gun lobby, even their members, the rank and file members, 60% of them agree to universal background checks. But their leadership, uh, they interpret the Second Amendment to the Constitution to be an unrestricted right to guns. So they believe that anybody, children, criminals, can. everybody should have a gun. And not alone can have a gun, but there should be no limitation on the type of the weaponry that they have, the power of the weaponry, the number of weapons, and in fact there are some states, uh, Texas, where they allow open carry. I mean they can literally walk around with an Armalife automatic rifle or semi-automatic rifle in their hands and you know walk into a playground and it's all perfectly legal. So this is clearly an area where you would like to see prevention. Oh, absolutely, yes. yes. Okay. You mentioned your wife there and you're, I know that um, you are now a grandfather and you perhaps since you have taken retirement have a little more time for family. And how do you spend your time since you've retired? Well, I, uh, I, first of all, I should talk perhaps a little bit about the decision to retire. Um, I really loved the work. Um, I just love the excitement and the, and the adrenaline. And one day my wife said to me, you know, well, how long are you going to continue to do this? And I'm going, what do you mean, how long am I going to continue to do this? She said, well, are you going to do this when you're 80? And I said, well, I'm not going to do it when I'm 80. And then she said, well, how about 70? And it... For the first time, I began to think about the fact that no matter how good you are in, in you know, trauma-type situations, there will come a time when your skills begin to decay. And I have seen doctors, surgeons, who are beginning to lose it. And they either don't recognize it or they don't want to acknowledge it. And I think that's a tragedy. So I decided that that was not going to happen to me. So I decided that I would retire when I was 60 years old. Mm -hmm. And um, we built a new hospital, and when I was 58, they offered an early retirement incentive. So I retired at, in it, well, to me, a young age, 58. And because I did it that way, I had to make decisions about what am I going to do with life after Time. trauma? And um, the first decision that I had to make was, did I want to continue to be involved in some way with the trauma in the hospital? And I decided not to, Katie, because I had trained my replacement. I was very interested in promoting women in surgery. And I'm very proud of the fact that at one stage, there's not a lot of women surgeons, and there's not a lot of women trauma surgeons. But at one stage, I had more female surgeons in my department than I had male, and I'm very proud of that. And my replacement actually was a woman, Dr. Roxanne Roberts. And I didn't feel it was right, you know, for the the old professor and chair that appeared hanging around. Hang in a row. You understand exactly. <laughs> I did the same. <laughs> did you? And really, I think it's a hard thing to do, yeah. to walk away from it. Yeah. But that was what I did. So then, what am I going to do after that? Well, actually, I went back to school. Right. I was very interested in natural history, the flora and the fauna and the yeah. environment. And I became a certified naturalist. And then I started walking. Okay. And uh, initially, Long distance walking to me is a meditative process. So I walked the Appalachian Trail in America, which is 2,100 miles. And that was profound. You're out there alone with everything that you need to live on your back. And you spend a lot of time just thinking about stuff. So that moved me to the concept of long distance walking as a sort of a pilgrimage, you know, trying to yes. meditate. And I've now walked the Camino, Camino de San Diego. Yes, yes, I have. 
And actually, I came back and walked across Ireland from Dublin to Valencia and across West Cork out into Shrone. And, uh, and I have just come back from finishing a walk from Canterbury Cathedral to Rome. My goodness. Yes. yes. So no I wonder you're looking so healthy and fit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I try and do yeah. a little every okay. year. Yeah. And um, it is something you said there about walking being uh, allowing you to think uh, brings me back to UCC mm -hmm. because our brand now is a tradition of independent thinking. You clearly have had a lot of independent thinking in your profession. Um, I wonder if you would have some words of wisdom for our students today. What would you like to say to them to encourage them in their careers or your your single biggest piece of advice? I will tell you that, you know, looking back on my life, uh, among the happiest times that I ever had, apart from my marriage and the birth of my children and my grandchild, was the time that I spent here at UCC. It was a fascinating time. I mean, I developed ties with my um, classmates, and it was, uh, it was the, the clinical orientation. So I would say to anybody who's here at UCC, enjoy it. Yes. Because right now you're concentrating on learning stuff and passing the exams. This is a very foundational time in your life. No matter where you go afterwards in your professional career, someone is going to ask you, where did you train? And when you say UCC, they may not know what it is. So you need to be able to tell them, this is what I learned at UCC. And it isn't just the academic stuff. I mean, I was involved in rowing. I mean, there, there yeah. are lots of other things that happen here. And I will say, particularly to people who are doing medicine here at University College Cork, it, it, it is superb training. I mean, I, I can see clear differences between the way that I was trained and the way that other medical graduates were trained from American, you know, high powered American medical schools. And uh, with the strength uh, that you see in the clinical based teaching, would that be the single biggest attribute that you think UCC should foster? For, for me, it was. Yes. And I'm sure it probably still is. But I think the most important thing is it's focused on patient mm -hmm. care. It's patient care. It's easy, especially in America, to get the concept that medicine becomes a business mm -hmm. and that there are, you know, there's medicine for the very rich and then there's different medicine for the very poor. I worked at the county hospital, which is a public hospital, and I really enjoyed that because part of its mission statement was we will take care of you no matter, yeah, who, no you matter who you are. And that was the sort of training that I got here. It didn't matter who you were. You are my patient. You are my responsibility and I will do the very best for you. And I understand as medicine progresses, technology is important and indeed you have to have access to the technology. But you can't lose the patient in the digital image. I mean, there is a person in there, a person that you are responsible mm. for. And I think that came across very, very, very clearly. Okay. And I will tell you, I just loved it here. Good. I just loved it here. And I probably didn't realize how much I loved it until I left. left. Right? Exactly. Yes. And I still have the fondest of memories. John, you've been uh, given this award. Uh, what does it mean to you? And before you answer, you I should emphasize that you've been given this award because your peers recognize you as having made a tremendous contribution by your work at Cook County, building up all the services that you have. But what does it mean to you personally and, of course, to your team? So, you know, when I was in active practice and chairman of the department, uh, I had a little office and I have gotten many awards during my life. So as I would get the awards, I would hang them up on my wall. So I had this entire wall filled with all of these awards. So then when I retired, you know, I had all of these awards, what am I going to do? So I looked at them and I said to myself, well, how many of these are meaningful to me? And at the moment, I only have two that are hanging on my wall. And the first was the Olga Jonasson Award. It was an award that was given by the medical students and the resident trainings to the person that they consider to be a superb teacher. 
and I'm very proud of that. The, the second award is called the Christian Fenger Award. There is a surgical society of surgeons who have been trained at the county hospital, and they give that award to the person that they consider to be a superb surgeon at the county, and I have that on my award. And the reason those two awards are so important to me is because they were given to me by people who knew me. Yes. And it, they had choices, but they chose me because they knew me. And I intend to put this award, the Alumni Award, on that wall as well, the third one, for exactly what you said. This is an award that is given to me by people who knew me and who appreciate what it is, what it is that I have done. I really can't tell you how honored I am to receive it. And frankly, I think it is I who should be giving the award to the University of College Cork because it was the university, but the training I received here at UCC that made it possible for me to do all of these things. And without that foundational training here at UCC, I would not have been able to do this. So I am incredibly pleased and proud. I can't tell you how honored I feel to have received this award. I'm delighted to hear that. Um, what advice would you give to other alumni uh, about staying in touch with the alma mater? Co uh, as chairman of the medical <laughs> alumni, I have to fly the flag. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you um, have got a lot out of your visit back to UCC this year. I'm sure you see a lot of changes. But would you encourage people to stay in touch with uh, UCC? Uh, very much. And I'm a little deficient there myself, I must say. And again, it isn't until you come back and you meet the friends and you sit down and they say, and do you remember the day when? And I go, oh, my God, I haven't thought about that for a million years. And these memories just bubble up. And they are great memories. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and coming back to the university, of course it's different. There's all yeah. these buildings and there's, you know, more activity and movement. But it's the same. You know, you, you say, the Alamex. Yes. That's where I received my diploma. Where you did your exams. Where I did my exams, yes. absolutely. Sweated. I sweated <laughs> and under the arch with the yes. notice boards. Yes. That's where they used to post the results. And yes. we would all crowd around. Is your name there or is it not there? The memories are great and the, 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 the people, the classmates that I had are great and I think it is very important to try and keep in contact and this is, as I said, this is the foundation of your career. This is where it starts. Okay. This is what you're going to owe all of your professional career to right here at UCC. Delighted to hear that. I'm going to ask you just one more okay. question. And it's it's been delightful to talk to you. Uh, is there anything you regret or that you would do different, either in your professional life or otherwise? And uh, allied to that, what are you most proud of in your okay. profession or in your life? Is there anything? I, um, I mean, looking back at it, um, I would say no. I I think. I would do the same thing. But I would say, look, look, if you had asked me when I was in medical school what it is that you, that you want to have happen, I would have described a totally different yes. life. Um, and I think one of the major decisions that I had to make was when I was at the, at the Cook County Hospital and I wanted to do clinical trauma, they told me, well, the only way you can do that is to spend five years with us and redo your entire training. And that was a pretty big decision. Uh, not a decision that I had planned on making five years of your life, but I think it was a very important one because it gave, that gave me the background in American medicine and the technology and the way that they think slightly different. So, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really um, say that I would change anything looking back, but it was a different kind of life. Okay. And the thing that I'm most proud of, Actually, I'm very proud of the unit and the people and okay. the fact that it's a team and it is a team. It isn't just me. You know, everyone goes, oh, you know, you're the director. No, no, no. It's, it's you know, the person who washes the floor. It is the, uh, the radiologist, the anesthesiologist. It's the, all of the support staff and particularly it's the nursing staff. But I am particularly proud, I think, of I did an enormous amount of work to try and create a trauma system in the city of Chicago. And trauma systems consist of getting the appropriate patient to the appropriate hospital in an appropriate time frame. 
So I worked with the fire department, I was the project medical director for the fire department, to train the paramedics to recognize that when they come on the scene of a serious injury, they need to recognize that of all those who are injured, about 5% of them have injuries that are life-threatening. So we train them how to recognize those injuries. And then they transport them, not to the nearest hospital, but to the nearest trauma unit. Right. And in the trauma unit, we have now established criteria that you have to have. The surgeon, the consultant surgeon, has to be physically present in the hospital 24 hours a day. And you have to have immediate access to an operating room. You have to have blood banking capabilities. Anesthesia has to be there. Nursing staff, allied health professionals. So there is a huge commitment on the part of the hospital. And doing that actually reduces what we call preventable deaths. You know, someone gets stabbed in the abdomen and they're bleeding. Uh, what you need is a surgeon inside that abdomen to control the bleeding. If you take them to the closest hospital and they can't get a surgeon in there, they Time will bleed to death. Correct. Yes. So to pass that, to, to bring that system into existence, it's a trauma system, was enormously complicated. We had to work with the fire department, with the other hospitals who would not become trauma centers. And we had to enact legislation. And again, if, if I had described my career when I was in medical school, I would not have thought that, uh, that a, a part of that was going to be interacting with politicians and the media. Yes. And you know, it is, I think, very important for us to realize that as professional people, that is part of our obligation. I mean, we have expertise and we need to sit with the people who have control of the levers of power and explain to them what the consequences of their decisions are. So that, I think, was something that I didn't realize I even had that skill, but I think I'm very happy that that system works and we have reduced the preventable death rate by about 25%. So of the patient, patients who, about one patient a day is saved now because of that system. So I'm very proud that of that. That must make you proud. It does indeed. Yes. John, it's been a great pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for coming back to UCC for doing this interview. I'd like to congratulate you again on behalf of all uh, medical alumni and UCC alumni and uh, wish you continued success in your next career. OK, thank well, you thank very you very much. much. Thank Indeed. you very much. And I'd like to say thank you to everybody here at UCC who was involved in giving me uh, this award and it's one that I will be immeasurably proud of. So Gorev Mila Mahagov Gulair Agus Gorev Mila Mahal Kalashtana Halskala Gorkik. Oh Slana Gaspanak Gafoil.